<clears throat> Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, yeah, we do need to gather together and talk about the things that we deal with every day. Because as we've been talking about over the last 16 weeks, we believe that the world is ready for a change. We see it on the social media. We see it in the political arena. We see it in, 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 in humanity as a whole. And we really believe as Christians that this change is going to happen in the, in the form of the second coming of Jesus. But in the meantime, we ask that you come and change our hearts so that we can be ready. In your name I pray, amen. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I've cheated because I already have mine open to that. But I will wait for you. <clears throat> and today, you better be ready to open up your Bibles. Well, we do it every time. But we're going to spend a lot of time in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. And, um, and so bear with me. This is the last long presentation. After that, uh, we're going to close off. We only have two more presentations after this. And... Uh, they will be a little shorter, but I, I have to cover this material. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. It says this. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, Neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Last week, if you were present with us, we talked about the mark of the beast. And I know that for many of you, it was a real eye-opener as to what this mark is. What the mark is what it is to worship it, and what it is to worship the image. But we're going to go deeper into this today. Because here, as we read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, we have a different group. And what identifies this group, at least in this verse, is that they did not worship the beast, they did not worship the image, and they did not receive the mark. What makes them different than those who do? In order to figure that out, I need to tell you a story. The story of the book of Revelation. I say it like this. The story of the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is a story of how God restores this world to where it was always meant to be because Satan took it to places where it was never meant to be. Unlike what you may think, the book of Revelation, with all of its symbols, images, and cryptic languages, is just a story. It's a story of how God restores this world. So, follow me carefully. <laughs> this is going to be an overview of the book of Revelation in like three minutes, which is unheard of. Uh, but I want you to just, just listen. Don't worry about writing anything down. I just want you to listen and follow me here. The book of Revelation says, right at the beginning, it says it's a revelation of who? Of Jesus Christ. We have to keep this in mind. Right at the beginning, we have seven churches. Revelation chapters 1 to 3 talks about seven churches. Now, yes, there were seven churches and more that were planted by the early Christians in Asia Minor 50 years after Jesus Christ had died. And inasmuch as those letters were written to speak to issues that those churches were ex experiencing in those days, Revelation chapter 1 to 3 is also 
uh, has a dual meaning in those seven churches that symbolize the seven eras of Christianity from Jesus' day to today. Those seven churches develop the fact that the struggles that those seven churches had around John's time or the struggles that church, that Christianity would have in seven different eras all the way till today. And interestingly enough, the last church, the Laodicean church, is a church that God says it is lukewarm. And he says, I wish you were hot or you were cold, but because you're lukewarm, all you want to do is make me vomit. This is the church of today. The first church, Ephesus, was a church that fell in love with Jesus. And then he says to them, don't lose your first love. All right, I'm going to keep going. This is true. This is amazing. We will see. I'll give, you, I'll give you a way for you to dig deeper into that. Then we go to seven seals. Revelation 5 all the way to Revelation 7. And those seals actually describe how the gospel was distorted over those seven eras. More specifically and in details. Very, very interesting. Then we go to Revelation verse Chapter 8 and 9, we have the seven trumpets. Yes, you're starting to get it. Seven is a number that God likes. Revelation 8 to 9 describes these seven trumpets, which is seven ways that God is trying to win us back over those seven eras. Then, interestingly enough, Revelation chapter 10 and 11 goes from total depravity because Revelation chapter, those chapters describe the French Revolution where they actually decided to just do away with God. And then a movement called the Millerite Movement who slowly but surely was bringing back the truth to the world. Then we have Revelation 16 to 19 which are the seven plagues, the seven vials, and the seven thunders, which is basically God letting the world live the consequences of their decisions. And then, last but not least, we have Revelation 20 to 22, which is the extinction of sin and the creation of a new world. And throughout all of this, we are to remember one thing, and one thing alone, Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the book of Revelation right there. But for those of you who like to go deeper into what I've just said, so that you don't just believe what I said, but you actually look into it, I dug up an old series of presentations that I did in 2015. It was called the Patmos Experience because John wrote the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos. And it is a 15 presentations ripping apart the things that I just shared with you. And I'm going to show you my communications director worked hard this week to put those sermons on our website so that you can go and listen to them. Because we're going to be done soon. And I know that you want to continue to listen to my pretty voice for 15 more weeks. And so... I'm going to show you how to do that. Again, you go to our website, and then you're going to go up to, uh, there's a little video here. You go up to church, and you go down to sermon archives. You click on that, and when you click on that, then you can go to all series right there. You click on that, and you go down to the Patmos experience, and if you wish, you can even filter that by going to filter and then it's going to give them to you, but they're not necessarily in order. So you can go descending, you can go ascending order, and you press filter, and there you are. You have sermons 1 to 16 on the book of Revelation. And then you click on that uh, first one, and there you have it. Um, there is no benefit to me for you to watch this. There's, there, you're not going to be asked for money. None of that stuff. But I just think it's, if you really are interested in understanding a book of Revelation uh, and, and, and understanding what I just shared with you about all those sevens, then I encourage you to go on our website and to look at those presentations. But today, I would like for us to focus 
you may have noticed that I skipped two chapters in that presentation, Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13. And that's because I want to go into more details into those for a moment. Because these two chapters show us the extent to which Satan has gone to the point where had it not been for the intervention of God, there would be no Christianity today. That's pretty serious. On the other hand, Revelation chapter 13 reveals that it is that same Christianity that falls away to Satan's deceptions as well, except for just a faithful few. So, let's go. Go to Revelation chapter 12. Turn your Bibles to it, and we're going to read the whole chapter, and I'm going to give you some details as we go down. Now, I, I want to remind you that I go into much more details into this in the sermon series that I just recommended that you watch. And so, if you don't understand some of the things that I'm sharing, you say, where is he getting this from? Well, you'll have to watch the sermon on Revelation chapter 12 and 13 in order to understand that. But let's read it together. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. <clears throat> let's stop right there. In apocalyptic literature, which is a literature that talks about the time of the end, what does a woman symbolize? Okay, that's correct. A woman symbolizes a church. Now, does it symbolize a good church or a bad church? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know until we get a description of the woman. So let's read this woman again. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Is this a good church or a bad church? We don't know, right? It's hard to know. But one thing we do know is that it's, seen, it's, it's got the sun, it's got the moon, and it's got 12 stars. The 12 stars represent the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament and the 12 disciples of the New Testament. This woman is standing on the truth, the Bible. It is the true, pure church, the church of the beginning. Now, did that, was that church perfect? No. It's made up of men and, and women who, who make mistakes, but the, they are standing on the word of God. Now, let's keep going. So this is the beginning, the beginning of the church. Now, let's see when this begins. It says, Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Okay. See, let me see if you've learned something so far as we've been talking about this. Is this literal or is this symbolic? Somebody said symbolic. Yes, this is the book of Revelation. This is not an actual woman that is actually giving birth to a baby. It's going to give us a little bit more details as we go down. But we understand now that this church, the church of the beginning with the 12 apostles, is about to give birth to a child. Let's keep going. Because then there's a break. It says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Who's this? Who's the dragon? Right? We know that the dragon is Satan. If you want to know where, who the dragon is, we'll read it a little later. This is Satan. We read this before, that when he had war in heaven, he actually deceived one-third of the angels. This is referring to Satan, and he started his deceptive work with the angels in heaven. Now, let's keep going. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Come on. Somebody tell me who this child is. This is Jesus. This is describing Jesus. The book of Isaiah describes him as one who would rule with a rod of iron. He is caught up to God. This is none other than Jesus who resurrected and went back to heaven so now what is the dragon trying to do to this child 
is trying to devour it. In other words, he wants to destroy this child. Interestingly enough, the Bible tells us that early on in the history of Jesus' life when he was born, Herod tried to kill Jesus when he found out that this king was born. He did everything he could, so much so that he killed, he asked the soldiers to kill every child under the age of two, every male child under the age of two. How cruel can that be? But we know from the story that John took his wife and his child and they went to Egypt and they stayed there for several years until Herod passed away and then they moved back. And so right there, because it was an angel that told Joseph, hey, pack up your bags and go. So God protected his child. Now let's keep going. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. This should ring a bell. This should ring a bell. We've talked about this. This woman that would be in the wilderness for 1,260 days, 42 months and three and a half years. These numbers should all start to ring a bell. And let's keep going. So this is basically, if a woman flees in the wilderness, that's the church that goes to a place where there's not a lot of people. And we know that for 1,260 years, they're called the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church did everything they could to kill anyone who opposed her and so people had to flee people lived in mountains people lived in places where they barely they could barely live and survive in order to protect themselves and then verse 7 says war broke out in heaven michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail so you see the dragon and his angels that's the third that he swept with his tail Right? There was a war in heaven. And he says, there was no place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Here we know who the dragon is. It describes him as Satan, and it also describes him as what he loves to do. He loves to deceive. If I'm lost, I'm going to try to see if as many other people can be lost as well. This is why I love that song that talked about redeem. You restore in me. You restore the things that were broken in me. That song is talking about what Jesus Christ is trying to do in you right now. Taking away the deception. Taking away the lies. And restoring in you what's true based on the word of God. Not based on what preachers and religions and people teach. But Satan has another plan. It says, it deceives the whole world and he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night has been cast down. If you feel guilty, that's because you were listening to the accuser. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he only has a short time. But it doesn't end there. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He goes from trying to destroy Jesus, who is the author of salvation, to now destroying the church. How does he do that? It says, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. This is the same thing as 1260 days earlier. Time, times and half a time. Time is a year, times is two years, half a time is half a year. Three and a half years is 42 months, 1260 days. I don't know why he just didn't say 1260 days again. I'm not God. I didn't write this. Maybe he wants us to search a little bit. Maybe he wants us to dig a little bit. But this is talking about the exact same thing. And he says that the woman, she's been persecuted, but she's given, 
She's given, she's given some, some rescue here. And it says in verse 15, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. This is how Satan has tried to destroy the church during those times. By a flood, by waters. And what does water symbolize? People. So he's using armies. Read your history book, folks. It's all over the place. Armies were, they were hunting people down in mountains, trying to kill them. They were, people were hiding in the sewers, in dungeons, in places where they could be safe. But they were getting hunted down. The, this dragon is using people to kill people. But look what happens. This is unbelievable. As we keep reading, it says, verse 16, But the earth helped the woman. Okay, follow me here. What is the earth? The earth helped the church. What is the earth? Let's go to the simple thing first. The earth is the opposite of water. So if water is people, the earth is no people. <laughs> A place where there's no people. Come on now. I know you're already, I know you're already shaking with excitement about what, you know, if you know your history, what place of no people saved people? Right? The Puritans, the pilgrims, left Europe on a boat, and in 1620, Plymouth was founded. Now, I know, 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but it took a while for America to be founded. But it was a place that was founded based on what? Spiritual, religious freedom. They were fleeing persecution, and they came to America, and they decided that they would plant a nation that would allow people to freely worship God. Come on, come on. God, the Bible, this is the Bible. This is the Bible talking about this. The dragon spewed out water, but the earth opened its mouth to swallow up the water to protect the woman. That's what it says. So the, but the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. But then look at this. The last, the last verse. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, but he leaves her alone, and he goes and makes war with the rest of her offsprings. And the Bible describes them as people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see the progression here? We start with a movement who believes in Jesus Christ. And the, 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 the book of Acts calls that movement the way. People are on fire. Paul goes out, starts planting churches in Corinth, in Galat, in, in, in Thessalonica, in, in, in all kinds of different places. There is a fire in the bones of these people who are saved by Jesus Christ. Persecution started. And then the Bible calls it the diaspora. People are fleeing for their lives. And as they're fleeing for their lives, wherever they go, they share the gospel. And churches are planted everywhere. So the devil is kicked out of heaven. He convinces a third of the angels to go with him. Then when Jesus is about to be born, he says, I better nip this in the bud. Let me just get rid of Jesus, then there's no cross, there's no resurrection, there's nothing. Of course, he fails. So then he goes after the church. And as he goes after the church, millions of people gave their lives. Millions of people died. Died because they would not follow the church. And then they go away. God provides a way for them to freely worship and to be able to create a place of, of love but then it says that the devil, who 
who was angry with the woman stops to fight the woman and just goes after the remnants. We start with a pure woman, with the sun, which is standing on the moon, and the 12 stars, and we end up with what? Leftovers. Why? Because of Revelation 13. Revelation 13 tells us how Satan was able to reduce God's church to a bunch of leftovers. Ch Satan changed his tactics from persecution to collaboration. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13. A lot of this is going to sound familiar. We've read it before. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. What does the sea symbolize? So that means that this beast is rising up out of where? A place where there's people. Let me just say a populated area. We've already learned this. We've studied this. This is where? What is this area? It's Europe, right? Because this beast is none other than the Vatican City or Papal Rome. We've already studied this. So I saw the beast rising up, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his end a blasphemous name. I gave you a picture of that beast last week. It says, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. We talked about the, the pagan influences on this beast, on this power, on this influence. And then we get to know where the power comes from. The dragon gave his power to this beast, his throne, and great authority. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan is behind this beast. Now, I want to remind you, it is behind the authorities. Not our friendly Catholic folks who go to church every day, but those who lead and those who have planned the organization itself. And I saw one of his heads as if he had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. We talked about this last week, right? Mussolini signed for the Vatican to come back into power even though the French in, in 1798 took the Pope captive and, you know, 140 years, but the wound was healed. Even the newspaper, the, 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 San, the San Francisco Chronicle talked about the wound being healed at the signing of this pact. And all, this is a scary verse, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped who? I'm not saying this, guys. The Bible is. They are worshiping Satan. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who was able to make war with him? That's tactic number one. Now let's look at tactic number two. Oh, let's keep going. This is, this is still talking about what this beast did. He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for how much? 42 months or 1260 years or time times and half a time this is talking about the exact same thing we just identified who this is now and we know from history that this is a roman catholic churches they called it the dark ages then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. We just talked about that. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Who ultimately are worshiping who? Except, it says... Those whose names have been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who has led into captivity shall go into captivity. And he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. God realizes that this is here. And he's asking for those to have patience. But it doesn't end there. If we keep going, this is going to blow your mind. Then I saw another beast coming up where? Okay. If this beast is coming up out of the earth, it means that it's an area that is not populated. And look how it describes this beast. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Is there something more innocent than a lamb? This nation that claims to have independence, a constitution that protects the rights of every single one of its citizens. This is talking none other than the United States. A beast, a power, a kingdom that took in those poor folks who fled the persecution of Europe to start a nation based on freedom, religious freedom. That's the lamb part of the religious freedom. But now we're about to read about how it speaks like a dragon. Check this out. And he, this beast that comes out of the earth, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Both of those beasts are in power together at the same time. And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Wow. This conglomeration of, of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of expression is actually going to cause their people to worship none other than Papal Rome. It identifies it at whose deadly wound was healed just in case we make a mistake and we don't know which beast this is. And this is how it does it. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire to come down from, on, from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived." He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Okay. We talked about this last week. What is the image of the beast? The image of the beast is not the beast. We talked last week about the fact that the image of the beast is none other than the teachings of the beast. And this is saying here, folks, that at some point in history, people, there will be what we call enforced worship. And you will have to worship the teachings that are being pushed by those in America. And if you don't follow those teachings and you don't accept them, People will be killed. I know this, this sounds like some kind of novel or Hollywood. This is serious. This is perhaps something that you have never heard before. But I challenge you to study this for yourself. Everybody. Is going to do this. Verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand and on their foreheads. 
and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 14 talks about this message that we talked about and it closes very interestingly. 14 verse 12 it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. The exact same verse that we read in 12. After the first beast, God asks for his saints to have patience. After the second beast, God has his saints to have patience. Because what they are seeing and what they are experiencing is mind-boggling. And people are dying spiritually and people are dying physically. I believe that the group that we just read in Revelation 14 verse 12, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus, I believe they are the sealed of God. If we read those verses, we read them again. Revelation twenty two fourteen is another one. It says, Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And then we join that with the two verses we just read, Revelation 12, 17, that says, And a dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offsprings who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And 14, 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, the reason for the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets is to help the world realize that slowly but surely over the last 2,000 years, Satan has succeeded in removing the concept of the true God from this world and from religion. That's why Satan focuses his efforts on just a small little group because he has everybody else where he wants them. Deceived. Go to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter, chapter 17 describes the church after the deception of the first and second beast. This is going to blow your mind. Revelation chapter 17, and we start in verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Okay, this is a woman again, right? This is a woman, and it says this. She sits on many waters, meaning people, with whom the kings of the earth communicate committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Fornication is to have an illicit relationship with someone who you haven't committed your life to. Some call it spiritual adultery, where you claim to have a marriage with someone, and yet you're having a sexual relationship with someone else. We keep going. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting, woman, on this scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Well, we just read that earlier. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication and on her head and on her forehead a name was written mystery Babylon the great the mother of whores and of the abominations of the earth I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and when I saw her I marveled with great amazement let me ask you a question if a woman in the Bible is a church, is this a good or a bad church? This 
is where the church ends up. Except for the leftovers. And there is something that identifies them as different than those who worship the beast, its mark, and the image. The church is identified as the mother of harlots, which means that this church has daughters who do what she does. The beast that comes out of the sea and the beast that comes out of the earth. We talked about this last week. The worshiping of the image is to be teaching the things that the Roman Catholic Church taught and claiming that those things come from the Bible. Secret rapture, the immortal soul, purgatory, hell, baptism by sprinkling, Sunday worship. Are you starting to get the picture that God is describing in Revelation chapter 12 and 17, a mastered plan from the devil to deceive the world, first by persecution and second by infiltration and collaboration. If you can't beat them, join them. I wanted to go through this with you because I wanted you to understand the flow of the book of Revelation and I wanted you to understand that all this, all of this points to that little group. And that little group is no different than the original. If you ever go to a place where you buy carpet and you buy this carpet that you install in your basement and you realize that you're missing a piece. And you go to the store and you say, I bought this, park, it's this carpet seven months ago and I'm missing a piece. They're going to say, well, go look in the remnant bin. They may not have that carpet anymore, but they may have it in a remnant bin. Now, when you go to the remnant bin and you find the exact same piece that you had at home, does that piece look any different than the first one? Is it the same as the original? It's exactly the same. The only difference is that it's a little piece. Which is exactly what God is saying here. Those who are still faithful to me are a few, but they look like the original. Standing on the word of God. And the faith and testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's go look at these sealed people. Go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7 describes them to us. And I really recommend that you have a look at sermon number 6 in the Patmos experience. That talks about this in details. It's so fascinating, the things that are in there. I wish I could go into these details with you, but I can't right now. It says, After those things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind shall not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Do you realize that right now as we speak, symbolically speaking, the angels are actually preventing us from destroying ourselves. This is what it means by they're holding the four winds. Wind in apocalyptic literature always symbolizes war, strife, and discord. And so you see these angels at the four corners of the earth holding the winds. It says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth. Or basically, don't let go of the winds yet. 
Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. I'm going to stop there. This is in direct contrast to the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is given on the forehead and the seal of God is put on the forehead. What is this seal of God? Well, there's two verses in the book of Revelation. You don't have to go there. I'll put them on the screen. Revelation chapter 22 verse 4. In Revelation 14, verse 1, it says, They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Or, then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, please don't go out and get a tattoo tomorrow morning with God, you know, just to make sure that you're sealed. As you know, and as if you learned by now, this is symbolic. What does it mean to have the Father's name on your forehead? Oh, well, forehead is the center of thinking, rational, logic, emotion. You know, what makes me sad is that in the entire religious world, out there, very few are talking about this comparison. The seal of God and the mark of the beast. I mean, it's so obvious that these two are diametrically opposite to one another. There are thousands of books and movies that have been written about the mark of the beast, but nothing about the seal of God. You would think that every preacher in this city where you live would be preaching about the seal of God and how to receive it because it seems to have eternal proportions in the book of Revelation. If I was you, that would raise a big question in my mind. If you have to have this to be saved, shouldn't we all be talking about it? I would like for you to leave this presentation today knowing what the seal of God is. So let's look at a few verses together. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 15. Just a little bit back from the book of Revelation. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and we'll start at verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. How can you be a worker that does not need to be ashamed? It says right here. Rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. This is just an example that he gives of people who don't preach the truth and have lead people away. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows who are His, and let everyone whose names, who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God has a people that he seals. And those that he seals are those who rightly divide the word of truth. I remember one time I was at the dorm, and the dean ordered pizza for all the RAs, which are resident assistants, those who are in charge of overseeing the dorm in their different section. 
And there was three of us, three of us RAs. It was a small dorm. And he ordered pizza, one pizza for the three of us. And by the time the head RA divided the pizza, I only had one piece. And they had the rest of the pizza. See, that's not rightly dividing the pizza. That's not being fair. That is not actually. And so when God says, I want you to rightly divide the word of truth, is make sure that when you slice it up, that you're slicing it up properly. Make sure that you don't just focus on one part of the Bible and then the rest you do away with. Or make sure that you don't emphasize certain things. Because if you do that, you end up not being true to the whole message of the Word of God. I've heard people who teach that you don't even need to read the Old Testament. I have people who teach that you don't read the book of Revelation. It's not for us. It's for the Jews who will come, come back after. And I, I have heard so many things. Don't believe any preacher. Believe the word of God. Sometimes you may need a preacher to help you understand, but it is your responsibility to pray and seek wisdom from God to see if he or she is telling the truth. Too many people are gullible, and just because some preacher is charismatic enough and sounds confident enough, we just swallow it whole. You have to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. No one can do that for you, but few people do it. Few people spend time in the Word of God. This is why most preachers and churches just like to give fluff, because that's what people want. They want to feel good, and, they want, and then the churches get to fill their coffers. Great music, amazing displays, amazing children's programs. But are they rightly dividing the Word of Truth? Or is it just a show in order to attract you? We need to become a divider of the word of God for ourselves. Because if we don't, we will get the mark of the beast. It's not going to be the seal of God that we're going to receive. Remember the three steps of the mark of the beast. Number one. They don't believe, they do not love the truth. Number two, they embrace a lie. And number three, they live unrighteous lives. We talked about this in 2 Thessalonians last week in details. Those are the things that you have to do in order to receive the mark of the beast. Watch the three steps to having a seal of God. And yes, you've guessed it. <laughs> They're directly opposite to those. 2 Corinthians 1 21 to 22, and I, you can go there if you like, but I'm going to put most of these verses on the screen because most of you now have become really good at by defining these things. But if you want to read it in your Bible, I'm giving you the time, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. I find this very interesting. It tells us where the ceiling comes from. Now he who establishes you, establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So this whole sealing, this whole sealing starts with the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to seal us, and it's the work of the second beast to make sure everyone receives the mark of the first beast. Holy Spirit, Versus the second beast. We're talking about a counterfeit trinity here. <laughs> Step number one. Ephesians chapter one. Verses 13 to 14. Again, Paul writing a letter to a church. This is a church that he really loved. And it was a church that was in love with Jesus. And it says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, 
in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise and His glory. In another verse in John 16 it says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. Folks, the first identification of the seal of God is when you believe and love the truth. Whereas the mark of the beast, they don't love the truth. Number one. Number two. John 16, verse 8. And when he has come, this is talking about the Holy Spirit, because this is the Spirit that seals, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. If the Holy Spirit reproves you of your sin, tell me, what is sin? What does the Bible describe sin as? In 1 John 3, 4, since sin is the transgression of the law. If you refuse to admit that what you're doing is wrong, then the sealing stops. You see, those who, believe, who have the mark of the beast, they embrace a lie. Those who have the seal of God, they embrace the law. Not as a method of salvation, Brady. But as an understanding that when I embrace the law, it reveals sin in me. We're going to get into that a little bit later. If you refuse to accept that the Holy Spirit judges by the law, then the, steel, the ceiling stops there. And how many people today, how many denominations today teach that the law has been done away with? And therefore, they embrace a lie. I have counseled and married many people in my career. And I can tell you that no potential wife or husband in their right mind, because there's some who are not in their right mind, <laughs> are going to seal the deal with an individual if they have serious issues and they aren't willing to admit them and to work on them. Nobody's going to do that. It's important that we take this full step. You're not going to have victory over all the issues right away. The law is going to show some things in you that, man, how am I going to get rid of this? I lie all the time. It comes out of me naturally. How am I? It's okay. Just admit it. That's the first thing we have to admit. The law reveals things in us. Remember that in analogy of the, of the mirror? And when you're dirty, you know, I, had put, I put dirt on my face. Some of you made fun of me because of that, right? And so, yeah, I don't know that I have dirt in my face until I look in the mirror and I see that there's dirt in my face. But if I look in the mirror long enough, is the dirt going to go away? No. We're going to need the third step in order for the dirt to go away. But ultimately, the law allows me to see that I'm dirty, but some people, they see the law and they would rather embrace a lie because the lie allows them to live their life the way they want to. Man, it's hard to accept. You may not have victory over issues right away, but you're admitting, you're admitting that you need more light, you need more help, and you need more strength. And that, my folks, is good enough for God. Because if you admit that, that means you're ready for. What was that word again that I said? It, redeem. You're ready to be redeemed. Like that song. You're willing to repair the things that are broken in me. How can you be repaired if you can't admit that you're broken? And trust me, this world is broken and so are you. I'm broken. I'm broken. And if it wasn't for redemption, 
I would not be where I am today. James, you wouldn't be where you are today. Neither would you, Melissa. I know that. And Rick and Brady, come on. We all know each other's stories here. That's the beautiful thing about church. You can try to go to church and act like you get it all together, but eventually when you get to know each other enough, you know that you don't have it all together. We're all broken, but you've all been helping me to heal as Jesus Christ has as well. You see, that's, that, that's what it's all about. Too many people believe a lie because the law tells them that they are wrong, whereas the lie tells them that they're right. There's a quote from Clarence Schilt that I've always enjoyed. It says, we do most of our sinning when we are right or when right is not happening to us. Man, my heart just, my heart right now is just overwhelmed with joy that you're hearing this. <laughs> I'm just so overwhelmed at what Jesus has done for me, what he has done for this world. And I'm glad that you're hearing the fact that Satan is trying to pull the wool over your eyes. And there are so many people that I wish would understand and accept this, people I love dearly. Step number three. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus speaking. It is your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the helper, the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. You see, the last part of the ceiling, Melissa, is that when you mess up, you can run to Jesus. Because guess what? It's his righteousness that matters. You see, the, the, po the people who receive the mark of the beast, they live in unrighteousness and they love it. But when we accept the comforter, see, the reason why the Holy Spirit is called the comforter is because we don't always get it right. But Jesus got it right. And Jesus' righteousness becomes yours. And because you accept Jesus' rightness in your life, you become to start act, you begin to act righteous. Let's, let's, let's look into this because this is beautiful. The Holy Spirit as a comforter points us to Jesus. He doesn't just reprove me of sin like we read in step number two through the law, but he points me straight to Jesus. The one who can forgive all sin and he can love you to sin no more. You, you will never be ashamed in the arms of Jesus. But rather, you will be faultless before God. And it's love that straightens us up along the way. Righteousness in Jesus is the last part of the ceiling. This is the complete sealing done by the Holy Spirit to a person who is willing to let God and let go. So let's come full circle here because I, I need to go into some deep theology with you. Um, we go back to these two verses, the commandments of God and the testimony or the faith of Jesus Christ. Those sealed by the Holy Spirit in the three ways that we just mentioned, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is no different than that right there. So let, let's, let's, let's get into it. We're going to get into some theology, and I hope that you can follow. And if you can't follow, then you can always listen to it again. <laughs> so that's the beauty of technology. In the book of Galatians, Paul writes something. Now, the book of Galatians is a book written to um, a church who have a whole bunch of Jewish people who have come into it and are trying to force circumcision on people because they believe that in order to be sealed, you need to be circumcised. And Paul here is fighting this, saying that, no, in order to be sealed, you just need to have Jesus Christ, not circumcised. So listen to his rationale. But before faith came, 
Remember, we talk about the two things, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ, or the testimony of Jesus Christ. But before faith came, who's faith? What's faith? Before faith came, what is that talking about? Yes, it's talking about Jesus. We were kept under the guard by the law. Kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. That we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we no longer need a tutor. I know, this is, like I said, this is deep theology. Some of you are like, huh? And I, I don't blame you. I was huh for about 25 years of, my, of, of being a Christian. Because I really think that, I really thought my whole life that all I need to do is do the right thing. And then Jesus likes me and then he'll take me up to heaven if I can keep it up until he comes back. That's why I'm like, okay, come Jesus, I'm good today. Today I'm good. I was nice to my sister. I gave some of my candies back to her that she had bought for me. And I'll, remember that story? She actually sent me a text. I was you really did that? Anyways, so, you know, I was, I'm good today, so come. And when I'm bad, I'm like, oh, I better, I better smarten up because I better get better before he comes. You see, this is, the, this is, this is the, the mentality of a lot of people. This is the, the problem with Seeing this as the remnants keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, a lot of people have put a lot of focus on one or the other. But God wants to give us that balance through those three ceilings from the Holy Spirit that we just talked about. You believe in love and accept the truth, then you embrace the law so that it leads you to Jesus Christ. Who is your only salvation? Here we have a balance of a remnant in that verse. A leftover or a sealed child of God. We don't do away with the law because the law is a tutor. And in Jesus' day, a tutor was one who brought the child to the teacher. So symbolically speaking, the commandments bring us to Christ or to faith or to righteousness by faith. But is that it? Is that it? Because that's what a lot of people teach. Who needs a tutor? Who needs a tutor? A child. If you said a child, I would agree with you. Children depend on tutors. Once the law has led you to Christ, it has done its job. The problem with a lot of religions, including mine, is that we sometimes put so much emphasis on the law of God, thinking that we are righteous because we keep the law. The commandments are not the end of righteousness. There's something more. The faith of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus. If we still need a tutor, then we're still a child. And we're not growing up in Christ. Well, we continue to save ourselves. Which means we don't need Jesus. Oh, follow me, please. Just bear with me. We're still not growing up. We cannot obtain righteousness through the commandments. We can only obtain righteousness through the faith or the testimony of Jesus Christ. But you don't know that you need that without the commandments. You see the balance? What is righteousness? And, and here, what I'm sharing with you right now is part of a sermon that I heard from a man by the name of Ivor Myers. I take no credit, but it is beautiful. What is righteousness? Righteousness is right doing so what do the Ten Commandments tell us the Ten Commandments tell us what not to do right thou shall not lie thou shall not commit adultery 
Thou shall not work on the Sabbath. Thou shall not bow yourself in front of graven images. Righteousness is not about what we don't do. Righteousness is right doing. So what we don't do cannot possibly make up righteousness, which is right doing. So we cannot focus on the do not. For example, do you keep the commandments? Okay, good, then you're righteous. We cannot focus on the do not instead of the do. We can focus on what not to do instead of focusing on what we should be doing. Now, what not to do is important, as I just said before. It leads us to Christ and allows for our relationship with God to be deeper and more meaningful. But not recognizing this will keep us at a child stage and we will never have the faith of Jesus and ultimately the character of Jesus. What is character? Character is about what we do. But if we don't grow up, we focus on what we don't do. Hey, I don't eat meat. Hey, I don't steal. I talk to some of my neighbors and say, I don't need to go to church because I don't do bad things. I don't listen to this kind of music. I don't wear these kind of clothes. I don't break the Sabbath. We have a don't religion. Righteousness is not about not doing. It's about right doing. So according to this verse, we're not justified by what we don't do, but rather we're justified by what Christ did. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith, by Christ. If you go later on in the verse, it says, For we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. The just shall live by faith in Romans 1.17, meaning by Jesus what he has done for us and he wants what he wants to do in us righteousness is not found in the law but in Jesus who shows us what to do Romans 3:20 says therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin what we just talked about but in verse 21 and 22, it says, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. The faith of Jesus. Through faith in Jesus. So we now begin to keep the commandments because it becomes natural for us to do so because Jesus is in us. Right? That's what faith is. Faith is acceptance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Is it possible that now we keep the law without seeing it? That's true faith. Because that's what it says in Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 10, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, the name of the Father in your forehead, and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And in verse, chapter 10, verse 16, it says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds, I will write them. This doesn't do away with the law. It simply shows that because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we keep it out of love. That's it. Did you know that dead people keep the commandments? They don't lie. They don't steal. They don't work on the Sabbath. They rest every Sabbath. 
We don't become righteous through the law. But we led to righteousness through the law. And then we begin to keep the law because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I know, this is, I know, I need to stop. <laughs> I love this verse. Galatians 5, 5 to 6. This is beautiful. This is where I want, I'm going to close now. I'm taking it to the end. But actually, no, there's a little bit more. Uh, it says, Galatians 5, 5 to 6 says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The testimony and the faith of Jesus Christ. For in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But faith working through love. I'm getting somewhere. The seal of God is manifested when someone led by Jesus by the law does the right thing out of love through faith in Jesus. Meaning, you can't do anything good unless Jesus is in you. Man, you can't have Jesus in you unless you admit that you're broken and you can't see that you're broken without the law. And you can't know the law unless somebody tells you and you hear it. The law says don't do, which is good, we need that. And the faith of Jesus says, do. The law tells us what not to do, and the faith of Jesus Christ shows us what to do, which is works of love. If you are only focused on keeping the commandments, but you're not seeing the faith of Jesus in doing works of love, you will not be sealed you will still be a child. This is what it means by having the faith and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Living like Christ. It means doing what Christ did. It means letting the Spirit do the work in us. Which is what we looked at earlier. Letting the Spirit do the work in us. In practical ways though, this is what a sealed person looks like. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 to 32, because we've got to make this practical, right? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But instead, do. Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Those are works of love. I read that, and I can tell you right now, I, I struggle with all three. I'm not kind to some people, and I'm not tenderhearted to certain people. Turn with me to your Bibles, if you wish. In Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it describes what a sealed person looks like, what it is to have the character, the faith or the testimony of Jesus Christ in you. Verse 22, it says, but the fruits of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit in you and He's sealing you, is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. This is what the Holy Spirit wants to put in you. Go to the book of Ephesians, just the next book over. Chapter 5 and verse 8, it says the same thing. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, all righteousness, and all truth. Hey, 
having the faith of Jesus results in right doing where Christ's character is reflected in us. I have many people who, after starting to come to church, they begin to read their Bibles and they tell me that their friends are noticing a change in them. They say, you know, people come up to me and tell me, you're not the same person you used to be. They didn't even try to change. Just that when they get to know Jesus and they spend time in his word, their lives change. I just wish it would happen quicker with me. But keep praying for me. I need the love of God in my heart so that I can be tenderhearted and loving to others. That change that happens in us is a combination of keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus Christ. Of knowing what not to do and knowing what to do. But I have to dig this to the last level. And I know that there's people who are screaming right now saying, you've got to talk about this. There is one commandment that will be the focus of attention in the near future. You remember last week we talked about Sunday as being the mark of, of, that the papacy in the Va Vatican City have labeled as their sign of authority. You remember that? There's even a quote saying, this is, the, this is how we broke the Reformation's back. Because they reform against us, yet they continue to keep all the things that we've taught. Including the day of worship. Listen to this quote. This is, this is a quote from a book called Plain Revelation, written by a man by the name of Ranko Stefanovic. I find this quote incredibly powerful. And I added the verses in there just so that we can refer to them as we read the quote. It says here, The faithfulness of those who are sealed has been suitably tested with every generation of Christians. Would you agree with me? Just don't keep reading. Stop. Stop. Okay? Look at me. Just for a minute. I know. Would you agree with me that throughout the history of Christianity, Christians have been tested all the time? Right? We, we talked about the truth. We talked about, you know, we talked about tenderness, kindness, all these different things, and, 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 and keeping away from evil and, and lying and all these different things. We've, all, we've been tested. The Christianity has been tested from, from day one. But listen to what he says. Now you can read again. However, The test of faithfulness and the final crisis is to keep God's commandments. You agree with me? Those two verses, Revelation 12, 19 and 14, verse 12, right? That's one of the tests, right? Right? Okay, I want to make sure you agree. In particular, the fourth commandment will become the test of obedience to God. And he quotes Revelation 14, verse 7. Let's go to it. Well, not he quotes, but I put it there. <laughs> Revelation 14, verse 7. It says, Then I saw, we'll start at verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, here's the parallel that Ranko Stefanovic is trying to make. Right here in the first angel's message that we just read, it is referring to God as creator. Correct? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the springs of water. Is there a commandment that also refers to God as creator. Now let's go. Let's go to this. Uh, let's finish this first. There is. It's, we'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> as the Sabbath was the sign of God's people in biblical times, you go to Exodus 31 verse 12 and Ezekiel 20, 
12 to 20, it talks about the fact that the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. So it will be the sign of loyalty to God in the final crisis. Let's go back to Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17. I, I know some of you felt like I was weak on this. Some of you believe in this and he needs to, let's go back to it. Revelation 13, verse 16 to 17. It says, sorry, verse 16 and 17. I want to go earlier, 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all. I would say he enforces or forces all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on their right hand or their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Possible that in the near future, since the Sabbath is the sign between God and his people, and that Sunday is one of the identifying marks of the beast. And if we read earlier in verse 14, and he deceives them who dwell on the earth by those signs which he granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image to be killed. Is it possible that there will be a day when people will not be able to worship on God's day? Is it possible that in the near future there's coming a time where there will be a coalition in the world to enforce Sunday worship? Here, I said it. I said it. I have nothing to back this up except for what I'm reading right here. And like I told you last week, I do not know how this will be enforced. Only the future will tell. Jesus is coming soon. And he wants your heart. He wants you. Has there been enough evidence over the last 16 weeks for you to realize that all he wants is your heart? And that God is a God of truth. He hates lies. And he hates people who lie on his behalf. But it breaks his heart. This is why he gave us this information. As the political world continues to move forward, and as the world gathers together to save the environment, to save the family, to protect us from pestilences such as COVID-19. Is it possible that somewhere down the road, somebody's going to say, we need to return back to God and let's worship on His day? And those who don't will be killed. I know it's a pretty harsh way to finish a sermon, isn't it? <laughs> I pray for you, all of you who are listening. And I pray for me because you know what? This message has really hit home for me today. Yeah, I may go to church on Saturday. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, we worship on Saturday. This is why today's Saturday. And, and we're going to start to do it again together next week, which I'm really excited about. do you have the testimony of Jesus Christ? He's the, is he the all in all in your life? When you have a testimony to share with people, is it the commandments or is it what Jesus has done in your life? Because Jesus is coming soon and there are many people who don't know it. 
and they're going to need you to live it. That's my prayer. Father in heaven, wow. I pray that the words that I have shared and the words that we have read will become true in the life of every person who is watching this today and who will watch it next week, next year, or five years down the road. Thank you for being so willing to warn us about the sealing of the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And Lord, this afternoon, we want to tell you that we don't really know how this is going to happen, how we're going to react, but we want to be sealed by the Holy Spirit. We want to embrace the truth. We want to embrace your law, and we want to embrace our righteousness in Jesus Christ alone. And as such, Father, we know that our lives will never be the same. We will have a peace that the Bible says surpasses all understanding. We will have joy, patience, long-suffering, kindness, self-control. Oh, God, thank you for being so willing to work in us because you created us from the beginning and you love us so much that you were willing to redeem us to replace the broken things that are in us. We welcome you to do this now. That when you return one day, we will not say rocks fall on us, but we will raise our hands and say, take us home, Father. Take us home. Amen.